Welcome to this series on security and compliance in the age of Web3. My name is Ronald Rodriguez, Senior Solutions Architect, and I am part of the security and compliance partner team at Amazon Web Services. Customers and partners are asking and looking to understand what is all this new Web3 that is happening in the technology space. Blockchains, NFTs, spatial computing, metaverse. What this means for my agency, they ask. What it means for my nonprofit, my public entity, or organization's mission. And of course, as we talk about what it is and what it can do for them, there's a always a follow-up question. How I go about it in a secure and compliant manner, following regulations that could be specific to the region, country, or customers I serve. This series looks to provide an introduction to these concepts from a security and compliance lens and how they are related to or with Web3 technologies. We will bring partners and customers alike to provide their story in the space, guidance and advice on tools and frameworks that you can leverage today to start securing your Web3 applications on Amazon Web Services. Hello and welcome to this session on blockchain governance and audit part of a series on security and compliance in the age of Web3. My name is Ronald Rodriguez. I am a senior solutions architect, and I am part of the security and compliance partner team at Amazon Web Services. For today's session, I have an auditor and partner joining us to talk about uh, blockchain, crypto, and digital tokens. Uh, his name is Scott Perry from Shellman. He has a point of view on blockchain, the protocols, governance, and audit that is driving change and adoption in the space. I will let him introduce uh, himself later in the presentation. So currently, customers and partners are asking about blockchain, immersed reality, Internet of Things, what it means for them and their organizations to not only leverage these technologies, but also how to design, deploy, build, and manage them in a secure and compliant way. The technical concepts such as uh, blockchain are dense in nature, so what we are looking to achieve in this presentation is to give you a baseline of the concept and what it means in the aspect of audit, governance, regulations, and compliance. So during this session, here's, here's what we're covering at a high level. So first, we're going to talk about Web3, what are the characteristics and technologies that are making it a reality and the focus of today's presentation on blockchain, where we're going to have a, a brief refresher on. Next, our partner, Scott, will start giving an overview of how they're seeing the space of Web3 regarding architecture, governance, and audit requirements. Further, our partner will explain at high level what are the security and controls attributes of blockchain and those controls attributes that are inherited by using cloud, and in this case, AWS Cloud. Lastly, to close, we will talk about security and compliance of your blockchain workloads with guidance and advice by using one of our frameworks to get you started with design and build of your solution. We will look at both AWS tools and open source tools that can help you mitigate risks and improve your security posture. When you Google um, what is Web3, chances are that you're going to find the definition as Web3.0 is the iteration from Web2 and Web2 is the iteration from Web1. So that, that doesn't tell you anything. Three comes after two, two comes after, after one. Uh, what we're trying to look is more of like what is real and what is being present on, on Web3, right? And one of those characteristics, and, and I'm going to go briefly about all, all of them, is semantic, decentralized, artificial intelligence immersive and ubiquitous. The one that we're going to be focusing on, on today is the one of decentralization or decentralized. And what I mean by decentralization is when you take the transfer of control and decision making from a centralized entity, it could be an individual organization or, or group, to a distributed network. So no centralized or central authority or central trusted authority manages, controls, or owns uh, that network. So that's that's blockchain, right? And and there, there are more technologies, there are more technologies than the, the four that we have in, in the slide. It's just that we're focusing for, for these uh, sessions on, on these characteristics and these technologies that have been the most prevalent and they, they showcase also use cases in those in those in the space of web three. So what blockchain so so why you will use blockchain when blockchain is good for and we're going to be again very brief 
about the definition of blockchain and what it is. We have a, a, a link at the end of this presentation that you can go to and learn more about blockchain, blockchain use cases, blockchain blogs, where you can learn more about the technology and the use cases that have been, uh, uh, been used in Amazon Web Services. So why, why blockchain? Number one, blockchain technology is well suited for complex workflows that span multiple organizations or what, or what we call uh, multi-party uh, businesses. In these cases, the organizations often most collaborate with each other, but none of them can rely on a specific member to manage the shared system of record, right? So either because they don't want them to have a competitive advantage or because they don't want dependencies over which they lack control. So before blockchain, uh, many industries were stuck in this situation. So they were passing paper around because uh, if you try to build an elaborate system, you will still be hampered by, by some of these weaknesses. So sometimes such businesses have relied on centralized third parties or escrow services in the case of financial settlement to take care of shared records or in some cases like in supply chains or provenance uh, track and trace. No organization had full oversight and there is some sort of organized chaos. So some of the use cases that blockchain have been uh, proven today is financial settlement, provenance, track and trace. And, and now we're seeing more and more in the identity and portable verifiable credential space as well. So, so why you will use it, you, you want to keep audible, transparent view of transactions. You want that cryptographic non-repudiation and you, you want that single source of truth between the participants or that multi-party businesses construct. Now, to talk more about the architectural model of the underlying Web3, I'm gonna pass it over to, to Scott so he can introduce himself and talk to us about that architectural model for Web3. Uh, take it over, Scott. Thanks, Ron, for the lead and I appreciate that. Before I continue with my part of the presentation, just want to introduce myself to you. My name is Scott Perry. I am a principal at Shellman, and I lead a practice in crypto and digital trust services. For the past 17 years, I've been auditing the business use of cryptography, including auditing public certificate authorities that issue certificates to websites and higher assurance identities for governing government contractors. But in the last seven years, I've focused my attention on using blockchain and smartphone technology to solve the user ID, password, and trustworthiness of the internet. Most recently, with a Linux Foundation project called the Trust Over IP Foundation. I'll be focusing my part of the webinar on the blockchain use of this architecture. So you're currently seeing a slide, which is the architectural model for Web3 that was developed by the Trust Over IP Foundation. And as you see, there are four layers and the architectural stack is separated between the technology and the governance stack layers. And the architectural model requires four interoperable layers that work together to create um, the use of public and private keys to manage verifiable credentials or claims made by issuers that we can store in digital wallets for exchange and use in digital life applications. And so I wanted to briefly uh, go over the stack layers and I'm gonna spend a little more time at layer one because they introduce the use of blockchain uh, as, a, as a recommended source uh, at that layer, and I'll explain that uh, just in a little bit. So at layer four, you're dealing with a set of credentials that we'll be using in, da in daily life uh, that's digitizing basically the, the physical credentials that we currently use, like credit cards and uh, health insurance cards, as well as other documents that we need uh, such as diplomas or certifications or any other uh, digital credential that has a claim uh, made by an issuer uh, about something that, that can be useful uh, that individuals, uh, holders, uh, can use 
um, for um, access to websites or access to um, security lines on the uh, on the airport uh, or other type of activities where it requires some verification. And so at layer four, we we have a governing framework that describes all of the players that are involved in the issuance of these verifiable credentials and the players that participate in that, whether that's lower level blockchains or smartphone operators or issuers, verifiers and such. And they all need to be identified and rules need to be established around uh, the use and issuance of these, uh, these claims made by the issuers. At layer three, the specific criteria around the issuance and the verification of these verifiable digital claims uh, are specified in a governance framework. And, um, and it, especially in a decentralized um, Web3 model where the issuers are, are making claims and these, these claims can be verified outside of the issuance ecosystem in another aspect for another purpose, it's important to carry through and carry over the, uh, the rules or the requirements that were set into the issuance of these documents in a governing framework that can be made available. So, 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 ish, so verifiers really understand what went into the creation of these uh, digital claims and they can use it for their purposes. At layer two, there's more spe specifications regarding the security of, of private keys that are stored within smartphones or other constructs that really uh, connotate a, uh, a wallet, so to speak, uh, that we can store private information that we can make available when we want to, as opposed to having um, larger third-party IT organizations hold our personal information for us. So it's absolutely critical that the security requirements of these uh, digital wallets are, um, are identified and maintained by hardware and software manufacturers that uh, want to play in this ecosystem. And those rules would be defined at the agent wallet in governance frameworks driven at that point. So at layer one, that's where the, the data store of public keys uh, are made available so that anytime uh, the verification of the issuance or the issuers of these claims, they can, they can access, verifiers can access uh, public keys that can be on available data stores. And the recommendation is to have them on blockchains. So to get more detailed into the data utility layer of the trust over IP stack, it's not a requirement to have public um, keys or decentralized identifiers to be uh, existing on blockchains, but certainly is a recommendation. It can be on other distributed layer uh, ledgers or, or other decentralized uh, file systems, but they have to be made available so that when um, there's a need to verify uh, a credential, such as on the line for TSA, for, uh, entering the, uh, getting past the security for, uh, for airports, you, and you're presented a digital driver's license, uh, you want the TSA agent to be able to access the, the, the public key of the issuer of that driver's license at any time and, and, and in any place. And so they need those, those uh, public keys need to be made available. And so on, uh, you know, as we look at governance requirements for these pieces of, of data that exist on blockchains and uh, other, other constructs um, at the utility layer, it's important that we have those rules specified in a framework, in, in a governance framework that's issued by a governing authority, ones that are, are responsible for managing 
uh, the addition of these of these record stores uh, into an available network and and the rules associated with uh, nodes or stewards that are if it's a blockchain network replicating uh, that blockchain uh, so that there is redundancy uh, and of and, and availability across the internet ar around that plus there's you know we also want to make sure that uh, the right to add records are fair and in agreement with with uh, the network itself. So the recommendation to have uh, data sitting in a generally available data stores is on a blockchain because the nature of the blockchain where you have a cryptographic chain of all activities uh, all records that are stored on that data store creates a sense of immutability, which means that records cannot be tampered with. You'd know if a record was changed. And so it creates a permanence, it create, creates a persistence of data that's required uh, in, this, in this ecosystem where we really need the availability of public keys uh, to be accessible at any time for a variety of reasons. Now, the concept of non-repudiation states that that we have confidence that that when records are stored, they're stored by the source that that um, is indisputable, and we and that creates a sense of integrity into the data store that blockchain can add to. The concept of zero knowledge proof is 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 advanced in 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 creating additional privacy, whereas we're trying to understand the the uh, constructs the the attributes of data without having to reveal the data itself. And a great example on zero knowledge proof is there may be data such as the date of birth sitting on a construct. Maybe it's in a smart wallet or such. And it's important that an individual knows that you want to you you want to convey that someone has reached an age of 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 usage, whether it's uh, to get a drink at a bar or such. But you don't want to reveal uh, reveal uh, the the actual age. You can create a zero knowledge proof that verifies that a person has reached the age of consent for this without having to reveal the data underlying it, such as the date of birth. And this is very privacy pr uh, protecting, which is an advanced uh, concept, which makes blockchain technology and cryptographic use very viable um, for these types of activities. Certainly, the nature of a blockchain where you have redundant uh, identical ledgers throughout a network uh, that's being maintained creates um, a great availability, such as if a node goes down, there's still uh, other nodes available to pick it up that have the identical uh, list of the entire blockchain associated with it, which also increases um, the, the, the requirement uh, for availability. Now, once you, you have the, these attributes that I just went over on the blockchain, and then you add that blockchain into the cloud, such as AWS, you're taking advantage of all of the cloud attributes um, that have made uh, putting critical applications extensible into a cloud infrastructure uh, that, that to create even more benefit uh, to the integrity and availability of, of, of blockchains. And so, um, you know, AWS has uh, many controls that uh, would enhance the availability of blockchains that are sitting in their cloud. They have a pressure tested platform that adds to the re reliability of records stored there. Uh, it has um, scalability tools, which is very advantageous because a lot of these blockchains, it's unclear about the rate of growth. Uh, with that, and cloud infrastructure uh, really works well to to deal with the scalability issues as as these blockchains are growing. 
um, the core aspects of, of security in a hardened infrastructure uh, of, of a cloud network like AWS enhances the viability of using data and relying upon data that's sitting in a cloud. Plus, there's, there's many different availability, uh, flexibility options, whether one node or an entire network can be sitting uh, within the cloud at various aspects or within uh, individual containers creates great ver ver uh, flexibility um, that allows for um, choices to be made regarding whether you know what whether parts of a of a blockchain network or all of the blockchain network um, is needed to be into that that secure uh, environment depending on the risk and. And individually, you know, cloud infrastructure creates redundancies for a single node. So even if a single node one goes down, it can bring itself up quite quickly using uh, the cloud infrastructure that AWS provides. Now in the marketplace, you know, there's there's been a lot of um, talk about uh, machine readable governance for uh, permissionless blockchains. But it's my experience that in the business use of blockchain, um, there's going to be more need for governance than ever before. And what is governance? Governance really drives a risk-driven model to address risks in the marketplace and create requirements to address risk um, and, and a, a accountability scheme that would measure how these requirements are being followed by participants in the scheme. In the Trust Over IP Foundation, we've created a governance meta model, a table of contents, so to speak, which really which houses all of the key components, all of the things needed to demonstrate what what governance is uh, for a, a a a layer of the Trust Over IP stack or individual ecosystems of, of artifacts, digital artifacts for Web 3.0. And so the governance meta model is broken up into two sections, uh, a primary document, which really um, contains all of the relevant information of what are we talking about? What is included in the scope of governance? Individual players, individual artifacts, there's a purpose, a scope, who is the governing authority running this governance model, and what are the general requirements, and, and what are the principles and objectives driving uh, the need for governance in the first place. On the right-hand side, there's a set of control documents, which guides kind of the set of constitutional items um, and requirements that the governing authority requires of its of its participants. So it includes a glossary. It's driven by a risk assessment that identifies the key risks it's trying to mitigate within its governance structure. It's creating a trust assurance and certification model, which holds players that are participating accountable to um, maintaining and, and asserting uh, the requirements that are included in the other sections of the govern of the control model, there are a variety of different requirements, uh, flavors of requirements, so to speak, that need to be considered by by a governing authority, such as how do you govern? How do you actually run the governance authority? What are the specific business requirements? How how do you sustain yourself from an econ economic model to keep um, to keep it viable? What are the technical interoperability requirements? What are the security and control requirements needed to, to, um, to exact um, trust uh, in, the, in the data and the interoperability of all the players participating in the blockchain network? And also, uh, Trust Over IP feels very strongly about in the inclusion and equitability and accessibility of data and requires that these types of requirements are considered as well. 
So when all of these documents are put together in, uh, in, in the governance framework, they form a constitution of how, how a blockchain network actually is run. And the document is a set, really a set of legislator and constitutional laws. And compliance is built off of those agreed requirements, agreed laws. And the governance framework is made available to anyone who wants to rely upon data and credentials or information that's derived from this network. And it's made available on uh, accessible web pages in a governance framework homepage. And so they all work together uh, to create reliability uh, for, for end users. Now, just to unpack the, the trust assurance side, how is accountability made for all of the requirements that are included in a governance framework? And I'll go over all the individual components, then I'll talk about how they uh, interoperate. So we just went over the governance meta model, which would create a governance framework, and that appears in yellow on the slide. And there are a set of musts that all, participant, all the participants in a blockchain network have to abide by. And they could you know, be, for example, they have to have compute power. They have to go through a process where they become uh, accepted as a node on the network and uh, have to generate um, you know, those requirements that are required of them, uh, network availability, compute power as such. Um, and so they're driven by a governing authority that has created that governance network or a proxy administrating party that actually is operating the governance framework. And once the governance framework is published and each individual governed party that plays a role into enforcing or, or abiding by those, those requirements, they are set to assert that they are meeting those requirements. And those requirements are, are from the governance framework are then derived into accountability criteria, trust assurance criteria. Now that can be either in one flavor or multiple flavors, depending on the level of assurance that you're, that you're driving for various scenarios within the ecosystem. And so you'll see level of assurance is, is absolutely critical because, you know, obviously if you want to get more assurance out of the, the um, accountability of actors that want to participate, it takes at a higher level of assurance, it takes more cost, energy, and it might involve other components such as an auditor and an audit accreditor. Auditors are third-party independent uh, technologists that independently reviews um, the governed party's evidence that they are meeting trust assurance criteria. And so auditors review manual controls and technical controls, sometimes credential formats uh, that are used that house verifiable credentials in this scenario and generate compliance reports that can be evaluated by the governing authority and the administrating authority to determine the level of conformance that these players uh, in the network are, are, are maintaining. And if there are non-conformances, what additional, what risks is, uh, remains, the residual risk remains that needs to be dealt with so that the public can provide, so that you, the network can provide confidence to the public. And if governed parties, if the, if the governance framework states that if I pass an audit through this set of controls and I receive a certain level of a report, then, the, then a listing of the governed party would be placed on a trust registry so that they can be an approved issuer, for example, or verifier of, of these credentials. And that creates greater trust so that uh, individuals that are um, receiving 
credentials from this issuer know that it has gone through a process of conformance and has demonstrated that they have successfully um, uh, provided the adequate evidence that they are meeting the requirements as stated in the governing framework. And in this infrastructure, since we're dealing with credentials, we could use credentials such as that uh, trust marks or audit reports to actually be included or links to them in a credential registry that also could be a blockchain or another decentralized uh, data store. So as we, you know, we talked a little bit about the trust criteria. Well, what are the specific nuances in the trust criteria for blockchain? What would be included in a blockchain uh, governance framework? Well, certainly, you know, we look at the, the roles and responsibilities of players in the network. And, you know, the terms are either a node or a steward, those that carry the in, copies of the entire ledger and then are permitted to add records to the, to the, to the ledger. Well, how are they, um, how are, are they controlled? Do, what agreements do they need to uh, meet and sign up to in order to be an active player in the blockchain network? And what are those requirements? And that, that can be driven either in separate legal agreements or be specific requirements in the, block, in the blockchain governance framework. Uh, all blockchains need to uh, subscribe to some consensus protocol, the agreement of how records get added and the compensation or not compensation that's attached to adding records uh, to a blockchain. And so what is the nature of that particular consensus protocol? Um, what are the uh, controls associated with uh, maintaining equity and fairness into the into the record addition process? And as we get to the third bullet, you know how we actually endorse a record and and enter a record um, to be added to the blockchain network. Um, what are the controls associated with doing that? And, and what validation is needed on requests to add records uh, to the blockchain, those need to be published and agreed to um, by, by the general network. Now, I think Ron had you know, alluded to something called a smart contract. That is a, uh, it is a machine readable uh, agreement that can be programmatically attached where by, by players that are um, agreeing to, um, to uh, standards and, 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 and can be loaded actually on the blockchain. So that once an agreement is made, um, it, cre it, it adds the immutable properties that blockchains can, can, can offer. And so um, records and agreements and contracts uh, can have great integrity um, and also can be facilitated through programmatic features like the smart contracts. And so um, the controls associated with who could act in a smart contract and how those smart contracts actually um, embed themselves within the blockchain, those controls need to be identified. And as you look at kind of the infrastructure supporting the blockchain, such as compute power, sustainability or growth, uh, ex you know, expansion of the records, um, controls associated with the integrity and availability need to ident be specifically identified. Network controls around who can access the blockchain, who can uh, add records to it um, need to be identified. Um, a specific construct like, like a fork management. Fork management, is you know where the blockchain changes um, it, its 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 status of the continuous chain of records. It's something that doesn't uh, happen very often. Shouldn't in most cases never happen. But it cre but if if it does, 
it needs to be accounted for in a controlled manner. And so the controls associated with preventing forks or addressing forks uh, in a timely way so that it, it keeps the viability of the blockchain network up is absolutely critical to be added to any blockchain governance framework. And there may be specific um, rules associated depending on the, the uh, blockchain technological um, platform that it's running in or the industry that it is operating against or the specific nature of the blockchain uh, that, that would make um, uh, you know, tailored rules um, be ad added to uh, the requirements of a blockchain governance framework. Now, my organization, Shellman, is, is, um, is launching a specific focus around digital and crypto services. Um, we have great expertise into delivering um, um, the accountability of, of these Web3 um, infrastructures that are emerging, such as cryptocurrency exchanges, blockchain networks, uh, digital identity providers for uh, decentralized identity and uh, and and blockchain um, providers, whether it's holding public um, public keys, decentralized identifiers, or special uh, interest um, data that uh, is emerging on the business use of blockchain. And uh, the you know, we apply a variety of our existing offerings into the infrastructure, such as SOC 2 reports, ISO certification audits. We are a certification body. Um, we can do um, smart contract audits. We get into code. We, are, we do penetration testing. We, we deal with cloud in a, in a concerted way um, in the FedRAMP work that we do and the CSA Cloud Security Alliance work that we do. We're very aligned with a lot of federal, U.S. federal government um, uh, trust criteria. And so we would love to hear more about um, your needs in this area and how we can assist you. So I'm going to pass this now back to Ron, who's going to go over the specific controls and the implementation of security and compliance on the blockchain in the AWS network. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. To continue our conversation, let's take a look to what are the common typical cybersecurity suspects in the blockchain space. Either you have experience or if you're new to the subject and look at the slide, you might feel that you know or have seen some of the cybersecurity suspects in the screen. And you're right. The only one that is common to blockchain and Web3 is the 51% or civil attack. In this type of attack, the malicious actor tries to take control of 51% or more of the blockchain nodes of that blockchain network. When that happens, the concept of decentralization is defeated. So there's there's an entity that controls and owns that blockchain network. So in the concept of decentralization, we're not achieving that. And that's the 51% attack, civil attack, which diminishes the, the consensus mechanism on a blockchain. Phishing attacks, ransomware, software supply chain, like the one we saw with SolarWinds, security misconfigurations, endpoint vulnerabilities, weak leak credentials, and social engineering. All these things are very common, not to Web3, not to blockchain, to, put, to what we know in IT and uh, we've, uh, we have known for the past 10, 20 years that are very common type of attack that we need to mitigate the risk of these things happening, not only to our blockchain, but the system around our blockchain workloads. Beyond blockchain, insider threats within your organization, tenant isolation, data residency, sovereignty, and data transfer. How you protect, let's say, if you if you have a regulation such as G GDPR or you plan to run blockchains in the European Union, you need to be aware and be very careful in your design of how you're going to place where that data is going to be placed and what type of data uh, can be placed in your blockchain. This is design considerations that you need to Keep in mind and, and build way earlier of your deployment of your blockchain. 
unauthorized access to data or government access to data, not only blocking their unauthorized access to that data, but how you provide their proper mechanisms to access that data and provide access to that data by government entities or authorities. Regulations that you need to follow, such as IRAP, PCI, DSS, FISMAT, FEDRAM, these are things that you need to consider when you're bu building your blockchain uh, network and if you plan to, out uh, to, uh, to operate within the, the regulations of a country or regulations such as uh, FEDRAM and others within, with, across the globe. Now, how we go about this? We're going to use a framework, and you see it on the screen. Uh, it's a derivative of the risk management frameworks, and, and we mold it to be able to, to be reused uh, across multiple technologies. So this is not a specific to blockchain. If you follow this framework, you're going to achieve a good security posture following good guidance and advice from well-proven techniques using AWS security automation and orchestration. So how these this framework helps you. And what's the goal? What outcomes are you going to get from it? So the goal is to help you customer partners and independent solution vendors to accelerate your security and compliance authorization process, to reduce the cost and time that it takes you to achieve that authorization to operate, and to provide you reusable artifacts, including guidelines, templates, tools, and pre-built samples from AWS and Amazon partners. So let's talk about, about those reusable artifacts, the guidance, the templates, the tools, and pre-built samples that you can use from both AWS and Amazon partners to help you achieve security and, and compliance, uh, to help you accelerate your security and compliance and authorization process. So let's take a look. Let's start with resource, resource provisioning. When you're provisioning uh, and building, deploying, and maintaining blockchain networks from scratch, or from zero, this is very complex. It is very complex and requires uh, that resource or person to have multiple skills across not only infrastructure, blockchain itself, and app development. But regardless of your use case, you should leverage automation and provision your environment using declarative templates because this complexity creates misconfiguration or, or, or misconfiguration in terms of your security will happen. So we're trying to mitigate those misconfiguration in terms of your security posture by leverage, leveraging these automation and, and, and provisioning of your environment using declarative templates. Now, I always want to take this a little bit further and, and bring you to the, the first uh, service that, that you can use to achieve this, and it's Amazon Managed Blockchain. Um, this is not an infrastructure provision. This is not automated infrastructure, neither a declarative template. This is a managed service for Amazon uh, Web Services. And why this is so important, it goes further than the automated infrastructure and declarative templates by taking uh, the, the handling of scalability, the handling of deploying the blockchain network. It takes care of that for you, so giving you more time to build your next NFT or non-fungible token in your blockchain solution. So you can leverage Amazon Managed Blockchain today. Uh, we currently support Hyperledger Fabric private permission networks and Ethereum full nodes that connect to the public mainnet and two popular test nets, uh, Rinkabai, Rinkabai and Robstein. So you can use Amazon Managed Blockchain to, to not only leverage that automated infrastructure provisioning and the clarity templates that Amazon Managed Blockchain leverage in the back end, but you, you then get the benefit of, of scalability and that management and operational burden out of your hands. If you still want to have more hands-on and be able to customize and have more control of the AWS infrastructure running your blockchain, you, you can have the opportunity to use AWS blockchain templates as in the middle. This will help you deploy Fabric and Ethereum blockchain networks on top of Elastic Compute Cloud, which is EC2, and Elastic Container Services, ECS. Lastly, if you have a need to have more control of your deployment or have a requirement to deploy be beyond Amazon Managed Services or what AWS blockchain templates provide, you can leverage, for example, this Hyperledger Bevel, uh, which is a blockchain automation framework from one of our partners, Accenture. With this automation framework, you can deploy different types of blockchain networks on top of AWS infrastructure. Again, leveraging uh, not only open source tools that, that use those declarative templates or infrastructure as code and help you automate that infrastructure. I believe it uses Terraform and Ansible to achieve this. 
Now, uh, in terms of configuration manage management, you need to have a, a package installation software, resource configuration, and system patching of your environment. What tools can help you with that? AWS Config, AWS System Manager, Prowler. Prowler is an open source software, uh, very similar to AWS Config. Both help you assess, audit, and evaluate the configuration of your AWS resources, enabling you by simply being, by simplifying compliance auditing, security analysis, and change management. And of course, with those three these three things in mind, it helps you with the operational troubleshooting. And how how it achieves this? So AWS Config specifically, it does this by continuously monitoring and recording configuration changes of your AWS resources. It continuously audit and assess the overall compliance of your AWS resources against previously defined policies and guidelines by you or your organization. And as a result, now you're able to track the relationships among resources and review resource dependencies prior to making those changes in your configuration. Now, once a change occurs, you're able to quickly review the history of the resource configuration and determine what the resource configurations looked like at any point in the past. Further, when you're using AWS Config and, and where we're talking about multi-tenancy or tenant isolation, you have you want to still have view of these different isolated environments. You have want to have a one view, a multi-account, multi-region aggregation of that configuration. So AWS Config does that for you. You can view compliance status across your entire enterprise or solution and identify non-compliant accounts when you run your, your blockchain workloads. AWS System Manager is an amazing tool to avoid security misconfigurations and unpatch endpoint vulnerabilities by maintaining that security and compliance. By and how do you achieve that? By scanning your instances against your patch configuration and custom policies already defined by your organization. Now, when we're talking about monitoring and performance, you need to monitor key metrics and logs of your environment. You want to visualize your application and infrastructure stack across these monitoring, uh, across these key metrics and logs. Now that you have that visualization and, and of your application and infrastructure stack, you can then create alarms, correlate metrics and logs to understand and resolve root cause of those performance issues. With this, CloudWatch helps you with the resource optimization by creating and enabling alarms to automate capacity and resource planning through auto scaling. Further, it gives you, now that you have all this data across your, your application infrastructure and services, you will gain visibility across your distributed blockchain stack, which means now further correlating and visualizing that metric to quickly pinpoint and resolve issues in your environment. With Amazon CloudWatch, you can visualize those screen metrics such as CPU utilization, memory. You can also correlate log patterns. For example, if you want, if you have a, an error that is specific to a metric, to quickly get the context of that metrics and go from diagnosing the problem to understanding the root, root cause of what caused that problem. Further, uh, let's talk about one of our open source. Uh, 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 let's talk about a, uh, an open source tool from one of our partners, Splunk. With this tool, you can achieve. They have actually multiple tools within Splunk DLT. One of them is monitoring and observability, which lands in this monitoring and performance area, and this is one that is open source. Um, I want to mention again, this this tool not only does monitoring and performance, it also does. Uh, detection and protection against vulnerabilities and also ledger anal analytics. Further, uh, AWS Security Hub for governance and compliance, it helps you with security posture management, uh, performs, this tool performs security best practice checks, aggregates alerts and enables automated remediation against those alerts. Now. What what it what is going to help you in terms of building your blockchain network? It will reduce greatly the effort to collect and prioritize security findings across accounts that you have running your blockchain network. In the case that you have multi accounts, from those integrated AWS services and further, AWS partner products such as the one that I already mentioned, uh, Splunk. Security Hub process this this data by using a standard finding format. When you're using this standard finding format el eliminates the need to manage finding data from multiple formats and try to figure out a one standard across the board. Basically, take the actions on, on, 
on analyzing, aggregating, and then uh, formatting all those uh, of the, those findings to look the same for, for being uh, ingested by the tool. Security Hub then does this for you, correlates the findings, uh, the providers, and prioritize them for uh, to be the most important ones in your environment. Once you define a standard and best practices uh, to follow, Security Hub can help you to automatically automatically run continuous account level configuration and security checks based on those AW, based on AWS best practices or those industry standards defined by you. Security Hub provides the result of these checks as a readiness score and identifies specific accounts and resources that require attention. Lastly, for your resource optimization of your blockchain environment, we have AWS Trusted Advisor, how it can help you by evaluating your AWS account by using checks. These checks are specific to identify ways to optimize your AWS infrastructure, improve your security, increase performance, reduce cost, and monitor service quotas. You can then follow the check recommendations to optimize your services and resources around your blockchain solution. Now, here are the additional resources. Let's say that you want to know more about our auditor, Chelman and their crypto D and digital services, my team, the ATO and AWS team, or other information we provide in this presentation. Here are the links and QR codes you can scan to get more information. Thank you to our partner, Scott from Chelman for joining us as part of this series on security and compliance in the age of Web3. My name is Ronald Rodriguez. Thank you for joining. See you next time.